Thanks so much, Rick. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak this year at the meeting. So I think as we'll see, toxicity is definitely the key. These are my disclosures, mostly consulting. So we all remember the excitement about targeting the PI3 kinase pathway downstream of the B cell receptor as well as of multiple microenvironmental signals. And we now have quite a few drugs in which CLL therapy is being studied. Adelalisib is the approved drug at the top, specific, relatively specific for Delta. Duvalisib was approved three weeks ago, and it inhibits both Delta and Gamma. Let me just remind you that Delta is the isoform primarily of interest for cell intrinsic effects on the B cells. Gamma may enhance microenvironment modulation in T cells and macrophages. Umbralisib is in clinical development, specific for Delta, but you'll note about tenfold less potent than Adela and Duvalisib against Delta. And then down at the bottom, I'm also going to speak briefly about ME401, Delta-specific in development. And then the other FDA-approved agent, in addition to Adela and Duvalisib, is Copanilisib, not approved in CLL, but approved for accelerated approval for follicular lymphoma is really a PAN inhibitor, as you can see, but somewhat more selective for alpha and delta. So uh, just starting off to remind you where we are with adelalisib, this was the first registration trial led to the approval of adelalisib rituximab in relapsed CLL patients in whom rituximab was an appropriate therapy. The median PFS of about 19 months compared to the placebo rituximab arm, seven months. No difference based on IGHV or 17P status. And we know that despite these results, adelalisib has not come into terribly widespread use. And this has been primarily related to a number of categories of toxicity that we now understand much better than we did initially. There's an autoimmune toxicity I'm going to talk about in much more detail. It can include transaminitis, diarrhea colitis in particular, and pneumonitis. There's neutropenia with sepsis and infection, which I think we mostly understand how to prophylax and monitor for this as hematologists, oncologists, and opportunistic infections, which also need to be prophylaxed in this patient population. So if we look at two of the registration trials for adelalisib, two years after the initiation of therapy, only about 20% of patients were still on therapy. And that was primarily due to coming off for adverse events. The rate of disease progression was only 15%. And so that gets back to those toxicities. And the autoimmune toxicities in particular were fairly rare in phase one, where the patients had five prior therapies, were more common in the relapsed registration trials, patients with two to three prior therapies, so about 14% colitis and transaminitis. But in initial therapy studies, they were much more common. And this suggested possibly an immune-type mechanism, since obviously normally we expect toxicities to be worse in more heavily pretreated patients. And as you know, when we do see these toxicities, it's important to have a low threshold for suspecting that they may be drug-related, even though the diarrhea may be at 12 months, 18 months into therapy, holding drug early, and then potentially coming in with steroids when infection has been ruled out, and potentially restarting with dose reduction. So in the upfront setting, we at Dana-Farber did a study of adelalisib with ofatumumab, which highlighted some of the toxicity issues in the frontline setting. 27 subjects were enrolled. The median time on therapy was eight months, which was partly because about half the patients stopped for toxicity, and then the other half were stopped when Gilead terminated their upfront registration trials, even though they were doing well. And so the median progression-free survival after the eight months on therapy was 23 months. But about half the patients haven't had subsequent therapy at now approximately three years. So we saw in this study that over half the patients had grade 3, 4 hepatotoxicity. And this was associated with an activated CD8-positive T-cell infiltrate in the liver, consistent with an immune mechanism. It also responded to steroids and often did not respond to drug holds. Sometimes it would, other times not, needed steroids. And if we looked across the patient population, you can see that roughly half the patients on top had the yellow stars, which was this early immune transaminitis. There's a group in the middle that had later more typical adelalisib toxicities. And then about a quarter of the patients at the bottom were doing great and had absolutely no side effects at all. So we're interested in trying to figure out who the quarter at the bottom are who can do well 
And so one thing we observed was that young patients had more toxicity. And in fact, all of them required steroids for toxicity. The other observation, which was slightly surprising, was that mutated lower risk IGHV was associated also with this autoimmune toxicity. And we still don't know exactly why this would be, but there are a couple hypotheses related to some of the immune modulation that CLL does with the immune system. Specifically that Tregs tend to be higher in unmutated patients, and that IL-17 tends to be more activated in mutated patients. So we looked in the Gilead registrational experience to see if we could confirm some of these observations. And in fact, across both their upfront trials and their relapse refractory trials, the, auto, uh, the transaminitis autoimmune toxicity was more common in younger patients. In the blue line, those less than 55, and actually going up almost monotonically by decade, and significantly lower in those over 75. And similarly, it was significantly higher in the untreated patients compared to the relapse refractory. So confirming the observations we had from our study. And so what about the immune hypothesis? Well, we know from preclinical data that delta is critical for Treg and effector T cell function, that delta kinase dead mice will develop an autoimmune colitis that can be abrogated by adoptive transfer of wild type Tregs, that mutations that disrupt Treg function in mice and humans lead to autoimmune syndromes that look a lot like adelalicid toxicity. And mice with genetic activation of Delta have enhanced immune-mediated cancer surveillance that's due specifically to the effect of Delta within the Tregs, despite also having reduced effector function. And so some of the arguments for this in the patients include the lymphocytic infiltrates that we've seen on liver biopsies that many groups have seen with the colitis, the fact that the toxicity is treatable and preventable with steroids, takes several weeks to occur initially, and then recurs very rapidly upon re-exposure to drug and the preclinical data, as well as a decrease that we observed in patients treated with Adela in Tregs, as shown here. So summary of Adela, which I view as a prototypical Delta inhibitor, is that we see these immune-mediated toxicities worse in younger patients and less heavily pretreated patients, and probably also in those with mutated IGBH. And so if we flip this around, we can think about who are good candidates for PI3 kinase inhibitor therapy, specifically older patients with more prior therapies and possibly unmutated IGBH, which we'll come back to. We see some immunologic correlates of the toxicity in our trial, decreased Tregs, increased IL-17. Mouse models support this as an on-target effect. And we'll talk about ways that people are attempting to combat this with novel drugs, which we're going to talk about for the rest of the talk, alternative schedules, potentially rational combinations. So duvalisib is our other FDA-approved option, just newly approved in CLL. And as I mentioned, it inhibits gamma as well as delta, which should enhance modulation of the microenvironment. From the phase one study, we know that in the CLL dose, we're continuously inhibiting delta at greater than the IC90 and about 50% inhibiting gamma greater than the IC50 for gamma. We see nice pharmacodynamic inhibition of phospho-AKT in key 67 as well as cytokine decreases in patients treated with duvalisib. And in the phase one to the PFS at 24 months was 59% as shown here. Now what about the tox? So the tox has roughly a similar profile to what we see with adelalisib. You can see here neutropenia, grade 3, 4, and about 40% of patients. And again, these were heavily pretreated patients. Diarrhea was about 9%. Pneumonias, again, common in the heavily pretreated population. Transaminitis was mostly lower grade, but 7% grade 3. So that brings us to DUO, which is the phase 3 study that led to the approval of duvalisib which was a randomized trial comparing duvalisib to ofatumumab in relapse refractory CLL patients with a median of two prior therapies. About a third of them had 17p deletion. Primary endpoint was progression-free survival. And this is the PFS as determined by investigators, where you can see the median PFS for duvalisib was 17.6 months. Make careful note of that. And compared to ofatumumab, where it was 9.7 months. And in duo, the AEs that we're particularly interested in are shown here. And so you can see rash and pneumonitis were relatively uncommon, although pneumonitis usually led to discontinuation. Transaminitis was less than we've seen with adelalisib, about 5%. The colitis and diarrhea we're seeing in the 10 to 15% range, but about 
a third of patients discontinued, which is a relatively low rate of discontinuation, suggesting that, again, having a low threshold for suspicion, holding drug, potentially using steroids, and dose reduction can help keep the patients on drug. And then neutropenia, again, common, especially in relapsed refractory patients, but not leading to discontinuation. And so we are embarking on combination studies now with duvalisib in particular. We've started a study with duvalisib and venetoclax and look forward to learning more about this agent as we're also continuing correlative studies. Now, the other FDA-approved drug, albeit not in CLL, is copanilisib, which, remember, is a PAN inhibitor. And there were eight SLL patients in the registration trial shown here with a 75% response rate. Duration of remission and PFS look about the same uh, for a low-grade lymphoma population as with the other drugs. But what about the tox profile? So the tox profile is different. It, there's infusional, remember this is an IV drug given weekly times three and then a week off. Infusional hyperglycemia and hypertension, which is usually self-limited and resolving, but sometimes will require therapy. And those are probably driven by alpha. In terms of the delta toxicities, we're seeing less diarrhea, 5% grade 3, 4 here, and less transaminitis. Lung infections are still pretty common, but again, a relapsed refractory population. And so it, it's not entirely clear why we see less delta activity or toxicity, but it may have to do with the fact that this is intravenous and on a punctuated schedule. And that's something for a further investigation, I think, as well as we explore this drug in CLL. So what about investigational drugs? So umbrilisib is in advanced clinical development, uh, formerly known as TGR1202. It's considered a next generation inhibitor based on having a different structure compared to adelalisib and duvalisib as shown here. And that in theory was to reduce transaminitis and toxicity. It also has some activity against casein kinase 1 epsilon in vitro, and the significance of this in terms of its activity and toxicity profile is really not yet understood, but it is distinct from the other drugs. And so in phase one, there was really an extended dose escalation with umbrilisib, as well as a reformulation to get adequate exposure and adequate dose. And ultimately, 800 milligrams of the micronized formulation was chosen. And you can see that in the left panel, with the purple bar, as a, it, this is an example of an individual patient escalating dose, that you get progressive improvement in nodal response with that escalated dose, suggesting that you're sort of on, not necessarily maximizing activity, I would say, at that dose. And this is consistent with what we see on the right, where most of the patient's exposure is probably in the 3,000 to 4,000 range, which is right around where you're expecting to see 50% reduction. Now, that being said, you can see here excellent reductions in nodes in the CLL patients treated at higher dose levels on the left, on the order of 90%. And in terms of time on study, we can see that there have been a number of discontinuations at short times, but there are patients also at quite long times in blue. But the number of patients exposed over a year is still relatively limited. Now, what about the safety? So this drug has been touted as having a much safer profile. And you can see here some of the numbers. These are toxicity data for patients treated at least six months with umbrilisib, the TGR1202 on the right, which we reported at EHA by my colleague, uh, Matt Davids. And you can see that the diarrhea rate is higher than it had been in previous reports, but it's still 8% compared to the 10 to 20% we're seeing with the other drugs. And similarly, transaminitis lower at 3%. Discontinuations due to adverse events, again, have gone up, but seem to be lower than the other drugs at about 12%. And so we'll continue to get more data about this, but it does appear that some of the toxicity is less in patients exposed for reasonable lengths of time. And this is the registration trial, which is either completed accrual or is very close to it in combination with ubilituximab, a CD20 antibody. And so given the safety profile, it may be somewhat easier to combine umbrilisib than some of the other drugs. And we've recently completed an umbrilisib plus ibrutinib study in relapsed refractory CLL, where response rate was 89%. PFS is very high, as one might expect, because these were mostly ibrutinib-naive patients. A few had had ibrutinib before. The CR rate is now about 29%. So it'll be interesting to follow that over time compared to historical controls with ibrutinib alone.
And then I wanted to say a word about ME401. This is highly selective for Delta, as we saw, and still in early clinical development. Has a very nice nodal responses in the phase one in follicular lymphoma and CLL, as shown here. The reason I wanted to comment on it is that they've built in an altered schedule of seven days on and then three weeks off to try and help better manage toxicity. And that's illustrated on here, the triangles on the swimmer plot show where patients switch to intermittent dosing. And you can see that all of the CLL patients in orange are still on dosing, and most of them on intermittent. One patient did progress, went back, and then responded again on the continuous dosing. And so this is an example of a novel way of managing the schedule to see if we can sort of manage side effects and preserve response. And so it'll be interesting to see what happens with that over time, as well as how that affects the immunomodulation. So in summary, adelalisib, dubalisib as well are both highly active, but they do cause this characteristic pattern of immune-mediated toxicity, which is a little unpredictable and can happen even at late times. And as I mentioned, it appears to be associated with younger age and less prior therapy, as well as potentially mutated IGHV, which we're working to confirm in other data sets, as well as a decrease in Tregs. And so when I think about who's the best candidate for these patients, as we'll discuss on the next slide again, older, more heavily pretreated patients. Capanilisib also approved not in CLL, though. We have limited data in CLL, and its AE profile seems to be driven more by alpha inhibition. Umbralisib is interesting. It does appear to have less toxicity, but responses are also a little bit slower, taking more like four to five months rather than two. And their data on depth and durability of response are still relatively limited. We also don't know much about how well delta or casein kinase 1 epsilon are inhibited in vivo. And so is there somewhat less exposure to drug, or is casein kinase 1 epsilon playing a role? But all of this may add up to it being better tolerated in some combinations. And then novel delta inhibitors, ME401, as well as the insight compound, are being explored on punctuated schedules to try to better manage toxicity. And so where do I use adelalisib? Where do I use duvalisib? So relapse patients who are intolerant of BTK inhibitors, potentially also those who progressed on BTK inhibitors, although we don't actually have data for the activity of these drugs in that setting in contrast to venetoclax. And then I also consider them in older pretreated patients who have significant comorbidities that may impact on BTK inhibitor or venetoclax tolerability. And specifically, you can use these drugs in patients with significant cardiac or renal comorbidity or who require anticoagulation. And again, if patients have had a couple of rounds of chemoimmunotherapy and are older, have had a good luck with less toxicity in my anecdotal experience. So the future, I think you can see there's a lot of interest in these drugs and a lot of ongoing clinical development. And so as a part of that, I'm hoping that we'll be able to identify better biomarkers for who has good responses and better tolerability. We may identify a better alternative schedule, perhaps a punctuated schedule. And then there may also be ways to identify rational combination partners that may also mitigate the toxicity. And then because of the immune activation that you do see with delta inhibitors, they're also being investigated as uh, immunomodulatory agents, even in solid tumors. And uh, thanks to all my colleagues at Dana-Farber working on PI3 kinase inhibitors. And thank you for your attention.